I thought I'd continue these uh, chats with you, and I apologize that they're always sort of off the cuff and off the top of my head, but clients were asking that I do more of them in these times when the market's going up and down and uh, higher and lower on almost and on a daily basis. So first thing I wanted to say is that uh, we're effectively now in a, a wartime footing. And uh, I, I like to say that you know the president's making decisions that are, are difficult in that we're attempting to save lives while also keeping the economy running. Uh, and obviously shutting down the entire economy and doing what they did in Wuhan, China, which is effectively a, a city as large as, as New York City, uh, is something we probably don't want to do here in America. Uh, it may be necessary eventually as we move through this, but initially we're trying to keep the gears of the economy going. And recent Fed actions, one of the questions I asked, and what I'll do is kind of go over a few questions that clients have been asking me. Um, one of the questions was, is what is the Federal Reserve doing with these repurchase agreements? And, and effectively, when you hear about you know, $500 billion or a trillion dollars coming in that the Fed's doing, just think of that as the, keeping the gears of the economy going. Uh, agreements between banks and lending between large businesses to pay their people, uh, short-term uh, loans between banks and other banks, uh, and between the federal government and banks to keep things going and to keep credit markets moving and running efficiently. This won't impact the points in the market from going up and down. This is just trying to keep a market going between buyers and sellers, like us, in terms of selling. It also doesn't mean there's not going to be extreme dislocations in price sometimes. What you have often in those type of scenarios is a, a, a stock or a bond, usually a bond, that is not as liquid, where people are forced to sell it and they won't get a price that's near as, uh, uh, as, as good as they would want. And oftentimes this is when, what's happening when you're panic selling or we just don't know what the price is going to be. And really, under such scenarios as we're in, in this wartime scenario, we used to call it the, you know, the fog of war, you have a lot of people kind of running around shell-shocked. Or think about it for those uh, of us who experienced hurricanes and horrific damage or have lived through tornadoes or earthquakes or, 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 or for those of you who have been in combat or flown aircraft like I have, when you get a very significant situation which uh, is life-threatening, you're, you're in shock at that point and it seems almost surreal. And it's difficult to think often in that scenario. So you want to just focus on what is knowable and usually don't want to act too quickly one way or another when you're thinking your way through the, through the problem. And there's going to be a lot of unknowable now as we look into the short term because we really don't know how long the coronavirus is going to, going to last. My assumption has been that uh, we're heading into a recession. I said last week that uh, we, were, we were already in a recession. We just didn't know when I was on Fox News. And I think that uh, that's likely to be the case here for the for the longer term as we wish, uh, you know, kind of wash through the uh, the, the summer and, and working our way through the pro through the problem. Now, what does that mean? There's no much like the mathematical algorithms and uh, the uh, Excel spreadsheets and that'll give you discounted cash flow models about a stock. All of that gets thrown out the window. Uh, and it's, it's those are the types of algorithms, if you read my book, I, I talk about it during the financial crisis, where there are no algorithms. And, and somebody finally says, what's the price of you know, this, this house in real estate for the collateralized debt obligations that are, uh, that are collateralized together? And, and finally, somebody says, what, this house is overpriced and, and the whole thing collapses. In my opinion, that's what we have with passive management. You know, all the stocks, I've been talking about this for months. It's in my book published in 2018, at the end of 2018, about how those stocks were, were getting overvalued. And I likened the, the MAGA stocks to the, the Nifty 50 as being overvalued when we had companies like Polaroid that were selling at 90 times earnings. And everybody had moved into passive management. And what happens is that index, that ETF, gets as the sales come in, everything in that index, including the good companies, gets thrown out with the, the bad companies that are overvalued. The huge benefit of us owning individual stocks and individual bonds, which I also talk about very often in my book, is that we're going to collect the income and wait while those assets are getting thrown out. The price of it's going to fluctuate dramatically. We, we can have a, uh, we, yesterday was the second largest point decline in one day in the history of the stock market. You'd have to go back to 1987 where we lost 22.5% uh, approximately uh, in one day. 
Uh, and, and then you have a day like you know yesterday or today where, where, where the market can rally back strongly. This is not new also. We saw this in 1929 where we had you know 12% losses, 12% losses two days, and then a snapback rally. I think the third largest day, looking up here, uh, was in 1929 after those two-day losses. And you get these you know dead cat bounces. It, the, the economy and, and the market are not going to be a V-shaped recovery in my opinion. Uh, and I say that because there's so much deep damage that's being done to so many different industries. This every situation in history is history uh, often you know rhymes, but it doesn't repeat itself exactly. So we can go back to the Spanish flu and say, okay, this is not going to be uh, as dramatic in that sense in terms of deaths. Uh, this isn't like the financial crisis in the sense that uh, that was a banking crisis. And we effectively bailed out the banks for right or wrong. Uh, often I have a whole chapter in my book about that too, where I, you know, not a big fan of the uh, of the large banks and a lot of what they were doing. But we just infused cash into the banks. Uh, one other idea was to take their bad assets out, but that would have taken a little longer. So so just infuse them and let the machine go on. A lot of banks created some bad habits and they and they started picking them up again. We had a tremendous amount of leverage. Uh, this time around, the banks are better capitalized and in better position, and the layoffs may not be as dramatic in that sense. Um, you can go back to 1973, 74, which was an oil crisis. Uh, that's, we've had a quick oil shock here where we have two alpha males, you know, Putin and the uh, Saudi prince going at it. Oil dropped again pretty significantly today, another 6%, I believe, uh, and we're, we're below $30 a barrel. Earlier this year, I had sold all the energy stocks in our portfolio because I thought we'd be between $50 and $60 a barrel. Uh, but then when I saw that our, 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 our debt, too, looked like uh, it was going to get uh, really badly impaired and we possibly would have more bankruptcies, it necessitated us selling a good portion, and the majority of our energy uh, debt positions, too. So sometimes when the world changes, you have to think about what's changing it from a global top-down perspective and then make bottom-up sector uh, allocation choices, uh, and then which stocks do we want to move into. So for example, today, not the markets closed, like I said, we, you know, we bought um, more positions in Budweiser uh, and Diageo that we own, and also, again, had purchased AbbVie, uh, which all these companies in the short term could certainly take a hit. And we're going to get whipsawed for a long time because I expect this to drag out for a long time. Uh, but from that position, I think we'll, we'll see these companies over the longer term uh, perform quite well. Uh, in the short term, again, nobody knows, and your guess is as good as mine what's going on. So our directive at Altris, of course, is to continue to get you income so that you can sustain yourself during this uh, time of extreme volatility. So we're holding more cash right now. We'll continue to buy more so I can supplement some of your income. But just to see how that actually impacts you is back on February 15th, we were getting a revenue of about 5% percent, about 4.9. So you can see that it was right around $50,000. Right now, that same million dollar portfolio is um, at about 5% yield, but only at about 44% in absolute income. And I'm gonna, again going to try to get that back up. And, and, and the research I'm doing and we're doing on our team here is uh, really trying to look into which dividends and companies do we think will be the most impacted and the most cut. And then which bonds do we think, in the worst case scenario, do we lose and should we you know, cut our losses or find more opportunities in this distressed credit market right now uh, and, and kind of buy into these sectors like we did during the uh, energy sell-off during uh, you know, 2015 and then like we did during when we bought a lot of the banks uh, during the financial crisis where I felt the federal government was going to be behind the system. Now, in this scenario... The federal government is doing a great deal. You can see Republicans and Democrats coming together quickly to get something done. They're talking about a trillion dollar stimulus plan. This plan should be a lot more popular with people because we're not bailing out the banks. I don't think we can rely on, we're certainly not going to invest based upon one sector or one industry getting bailed out, such as the airlines or the uh, hotel companies. To me, this could be a bailout of the American people because that's who's going to get most hurt. When I think about the shirt to be dry cleaned, you know, you know, we're not going into work as much. And I go to my dry cleaners, who happens to be a former investment banker uh, who got laid off during 2008 and started the dry cleaning business. You know, he's not going to have as much business during this time. He's going to need some forbearance on maybe taxes, 
payroll taxes to his employees so he doesn't have to lay off as many people as the industries get shut down here in New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, and across the country. Each American is going to need some help who, who, who is, uh, who's financially stressed and those who are forced home. And the layoffs are going to be significant. Uh, the layoffs in the industries and furloughs are, are, are already coming. Uh, we at Altrius have taken a pay cut. You know, what's nice about our strategy is our clients get the same income, but we're paid based upon portfolio values. So I always tell our clients is don't anchor in. One of the, client, one of the uh, questions I'm getting asked is, uh, when do I think this will recover? And the answer is I'm not really sure. All right, the, the, the Great Depression took a very, very long time. I don't think we're in that type of uh, scenario. My daughter and I were talking about it last night is having a Federal Reserve that's active and having a government that's active can um, eliminate for the most part, depressions. But what it can eliminate is recessions. And actions they take in, that, that are, are positive uh, can dampen the, the length of that recession also often. So I expect the government to have a large infusion of cash into the system, which I think will be tremendously uh, beneficial. And um, you know, here at Altrus, again, we're, we're cut, cutting salaries, uh, don't wanna lay anybody off, Fighting hard to do that, so we're, we're we're working our way through that. Cutting things as as, as little as you know um, the water bottles or or uh, the the coffee in our offices. Uh, all of those things can matter and add up to little savings, and that's what we're all doing with our households. Effectively, changes that Annie and I have made in our personal finances. You can make little changes where we're not going to take trips right to Europe, like most of us are not going to take because we can't right now, and that saves money to help us to purchase food. And to help us to, you know, when, when things kind of do get back to a normalcy, to go back. So we all have to go through our own personal budgets to try to tighten up, uh, understanding that the income may not change much for you. Uh, but we have to go to that wartime footing where we're thinking about uh, our strategies to make sure we can continue to pay our mortgages, continue to pay our regular bills and our finances. And in that sense, we will because the American consumer, a lot of that spending is on autopilot for the great majority of us. And that will keep the economy also going somewhat well in a lot of industries and sectors. But some are going to be irreparably damaged. Uh, we want to try to avoid those because uh, we don't want to dive into a particular industry and hope there's a bailout because I honestly don't think there's going to be a government bailout, nor do I think there should be. There's going to be some industries that uh, are likely going to be better having gone through a restructuring and a bankruptcy uh, where the people will still keep their jobs, right? So as a former pilot, so if, I, if I went off to fly for the airlines and I'm furloughed for a while, I'll have to find some other work uh, until I can get hired uh, back on. And so maybe the, maybe the airline industry will get a, a bailout, uh, those that we can look things more cert to where it'll help jobs, um, but then where certain industries where it won't be able to be effective, uh, those industries will go through the bankruptcy process. And again, most people will still have jobs through that period, uh, but the industry ownership itself will change hands. Um, and I think that for all of us, that's going to be the important thing to work through. And that's where you should call us if you have questions about your personal finances. You know, in good years, like last year, everybody goes off to Italy and, and spends $10,000 on vacations. And you know, Jim, I just want to take 10 grand out. Things are great. We made a lot of money. And you can do that in the good years. Um, but if we keep to the dividends and interest in our portfolio, you know, that those dividends and interest are paying you 4.5% a year, then that's really going to keep you in good stead and a good footing throughout this. Of course, Pepsi could cut their dividend, but I think it's highly unlikely. Uh, and that's been our strategy. Let me see if I had any other questions that I thought would be um, interesting. Uh, again, I, I talked about the advantage of, uh, of having individual stocks and bonds over ETFs, and especially illiquid ETFs and mutual funds that, that we own. I own the same stocks and bonds and all of our associates are also in our funds as you do. And we're making these same decisions for us as we are uh, for you as we, as we go through this. So normally a recovery could take two to four years, but don't anchor in on your price. You know, that's a mistake that a lot of us make, whether it's a home or whether it's your portfolio value. If your portfolio value was a million dollars three weeks ago and that was the high watermark, you know, those of you who have been with us for a long time, uh, 10, 20 years, you're still up tremendously and your portfolio has still done tremendously well. And uh, you know, don't anchor at that, that high water mark uh, because we really want to think about the future now in terms of let's make the decisions based upon what we have right now as if the money was in cash, 
right? And again, we're holding about 40% in stock, uh, a little more than 10% in cash, and the remainder in bonds for our portfolio to produce that income for you. And then finding investments in companies that I think were just thrown out because of this massive proliferation of passive investment and investment in uh, and momentum stocks that we're just going to, you know, the, the old Wall Street saying of the trend is your friend. It's stupidity. I talk about in chapter one of my book, but it's often what Wall Street does. And a lot of young kids, and I say kids, you know, 20 something, 30 something that have been in business and just got their newly minted MBAs. That's all the world they remember. They don't even remember the financial crisis. And if they remember the financial crisis, they've been okay with that strategy. Uh, that's never been a good strategy for me. I'd rather get fired by a client who said, "Oh, we only made you know 28% in your stocks last year, and the, you know the S&P made more, or or, or or you know why do we have bonds at all in our, in our portfolio?" Uh, clients who have bonds in their portfolio now, we're not hearing that in the last two weeks from clients uh, who wanted us to get more aggressive, and it was a good thing we were only at 52% stock uh, for the majority of our clients leading into this uh, recession. I think we're heading into. So I hope this fireside chat or candleside chat was, uh, was helpful. If I didn't cover something that you had, uh, feel free to give me an email. You know I'm always working. If you email me at 11 o'clock tonight, you'll get an email back. And call anytime uh, that you have a question. And again, our, our, our video conferences are great. Every morning we get on with our different offices and a lot of people working from home obviously now. And we just have a video conference with one another and we can see one another and it's a great way for us to communicate with you too. All you have to do is click the link on your email and you can see us on your phone or your, your iPad or your personal computer. It's very, very simple to do. But don't hesitate to call. We uh, appreciate your continued trust. Thank you.